Does this work? Can you hear me? If not, I'll just speak up louder. Thank you for blessing me. I don't know about you, but you picked a couple of songs that really spoke to me. And believe it or not, one of the songs, I, God willing, will be played at my funeral because I'm thinking of it. Because it can happen any day. But is God still in charge? Yes, he is. So my wife asked me to introduce myself and her to you. And maybe you hear it on my voice. I, I'm not born in Canada. I can't help it. So you have to forgive me. Any idea where I come from? One more time. Yes. But where do you, where, where are you born? Philippines. What language do you speak? What, but what language do you speak? Tagalog. Do you think you can pray in Tagalog the Lord's Prayer? Maybe not? Maybe not. Okay. I need to have translated. Oh, okay. Because what I hope that we will hear the Lord's Prayer in the middle of my sermon in a different language. Maybe you have to hear German, if no other volunteers here. Because God listens to all of us, no matter what language we speak. So I'm born in Germany. I'm born very close to the eastern border. And so becoming a soldier was a, a social mandate. So I was a professional soldier for many years. And in this time, God spoke to me and said, look, there's enough problems in the world. You don't need to add to it. And as my child, your job can't be hurting people. You just follow me. Huh. Now, I didn't like to hear that, really, because I really liked the money that you get as a soldier. I don't know about the Canadian Army, but as a German soldier, at least in my time, you were well paid. Especially when you are in a special force. You get a little bit extra pay because we had only single guys, unmarried people in our unit, if you get my hint. If you got married, you got transferred. So I was living very close to the border in a city that was surrounded, almost semi-surrounded by the border. And so it was stuck in time. The 40s were still there. The last building in my hometown that got dismantled from the war was in the mid-80s. My mother still lives in the same apartment I grew up in. She lives there around 60 years. But God is good. The borders opened. And you should have seen us, Germans, when the border opened. It's as if paradise happened. For three days, we were excited. And then we were irritated with all the foreigners who spoke a different German, who were differently closed. And they came with really those fancy cars that smelled different because they were two tacked engine. And they needed our help. A little bit like the refugees, we have difficulties really to adopt. But the great thing is that the church in Germany really shined and was opened. Even today, the church I became a Christian through is still accepting refugees, although Germany is now overwhelmed, so the politicians are saying, and I'm not sure if you are following with refugees. Germans have come to the point where they don't want to share their blessings. 
it's very difficult to give up what we become to accept or to accept as normal in our lives, the full fridge, electricity, a house for ourselves, a yard we don't need to share. So, and while I became a Christian in the army, it took God still four years to convert me to be a follower, to understand that it cost us something to be a follower of Christ. And so I left the army, went back to school, to university, studied economy, and became a missionary in Africa, Sierra Leone, one of the richest countries in the world on gold and diamonds, and yet the poorest country even today. And while I was there, one of the most wicked civil wars broke out in human history. We stayed there for four years, and then there was nowhere else to go but to the airport. And so we ran. And I took with me a shirt, a white shirt, short sleeves, and the computer, and nothing else. And then I sat there with the other experts at a makeshift airfield, wondering if we can still make it. God is good. And then I'm not quite sure what am I going to do because it didn't make any sense what I saw because I learned about a God of love and there I saw brutality on a daily basis. And I said, hmm, maybe I didn't quite get this book here. Maybe I cherry-picked what I wanted to know about God. And so I went to a Bible school to study a little bit missiology, to understand God a little bit better. But God is good. There was a young lady um, who was attracted to me. And she was very, very stubborn. She still is. And she's still lovely. Even after 25 years. God is good. We have three children. Two of them are at university. One and all more or less at home still. God is good. And now I'm here and I'm blessed. Blessed because I meet brothers and sisters I haven't seen before. I spoke with some of you. And I'm so thrilled to get to know you for a little bit. And there's no rush because there's still time to come. If not in this life, then in the life to come. So much of our lives, and now I go to my sermon and I still have 40 minutes to go. So much of our lives are spent giving attention to the thousands and thousands and one activities of our daily lives some of which are absolutely necessary, some perhaps not. We are busy making a living, and most of you are still making a living. Others are blessed of receiving pension. And I hope you are healthy enough to really enjoy it. But most of us are busy making a living, advancing our career, tending to our gardens, planning this or that celebration, doing the laundry, watching the news, getting the groceries. Life can be busy in many ways. We make our lives busy. Just look at your calendar, the doctor appointments that are coming up the older we get. I have a couple. In fact, I see doctors daily. Because I am, um, how we call it, now I'm looking for the English word, 
diagnosed with a terminal illness. It's called aging. Anybody has this illness as well? No one? Oh my goodness. I must be in paradise already. But I go ahead of me. Oh, as our friend did a little bit with the song and he had to stop and had to catch up. I want us this morning to take a moment of inhaling. Can we do this? And exhaling. To receive God's blessing and keep on receiving Keep on receiving, keep on receiving, and then we faint. Why? Because we can't just inhale. We need to exhale. We need to be a blessing to one another. And so I long for change. I long for the change in me that my breathing is more regularly, more balanced, in and out, in and out, and not just in, 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 in. And when I can't help it anymore, when I have so much leftovers, that I become generous. Who is longing for change in this world? Is it just me? Anyone? Really? The rest of you is really totally content with the world? Who is a liar? Any volunteers? Hmm. Not sure. I certainly long to see a better world in which peace and justice prevail, in which the church becomes the church of inhalers for the purpose of becoming exhalers. Only then we are alive. When we are breathing in and when we are breathing out. I dream of change at my work. Does anybody know what I'm working? What my job is? Beside public speaker, getting well paid every Sunday? I work in a hospital as a chaplain. Usually a hospital is intended to be a place of healing, am I right? Where we save people's lives. But let me tell you, I have not seen any person being saved in a hospital. Their life being saved. Extended perhaps, but not saved. The hospital is not a place of safety, but of extension. And I need new glasses. Can you take a note on this? It's just. Many days I see patients whose life is simply extended, they're suffering is extended. Sometimes I encounter a person, well, rather often, I encounter a person who is at the twilight of their lives, at times, minutes. Suddenly I hear through the speaker, Manfred, Manfred, unit two, unit two. When it's double-double, I know does anybody know what this means? Go fast. Uh, this is just meeting, but if it's double-double, be fast. And then I hear questions. What were my goals in life? And have I been able to reach any of them? 
Am I really loved by someone? Was there a reason for life at all? What if? What if there's more to life? These are not easy questions to answer, especially when you have perhaps an hour or less with the person. The answers might even be painful, because at times the person dies without family. But what is the harm to give it some thought? Because I don't like to tell you this, some of you will die. Well, actually, in fact, all of you. And I hope you will have different questions. But questions you will have. Because I have been at the side or bedside of pastors, of church leaders, of professors, and even of a doctor. All are wondering, was my life worth living? I can't answer that question. But it's a current question right now. The life I live right now. Do I inhale and I'm really enjoying life? But do I also exhale and bring joy to the life of others? Sometimes I wish the patient I speak to would have a neighbor, maybe a former colleague, or a person who knew the Lord's Prayer would have gone across the street to him and said, hey, come over, have a picnic with me, have a coffee. But too often, they have actually poor experiences with churches. And I have been a pastor for 24 years. So I'm guilty of that. I was so busy with the walls of the church, with inhaling, that I at times forgot to exhale. As human beings, pastors included, and the Lord's Prayer points to that, we are prone to make mistakes, either intentionally Anybody who does intentionally mistakes beside me? Maybe I'm the only honest person in this room. Shannon, you can help me here. <laughs> Sometimes we do it just unintentionally. But the Lord's Prayer basically forces us to reflect. What is it saying? Forgive us our sins. So we affirm that we are sinners and help us, and I paraphrase now, to forgive those who have sinned against us. Help us to exhale. Help us to be a blessing to them. Let me tell you, sometimes it's really, really difficult for pastors to be a blessing. Pastors get hurt. The disciples of Jesus, when they asked Jesus, teach us something, lived in a world not unlike ours. They had lived lives in need for change, lives in need for love and truth, lives in need for forgiveness. They too longed for change and they saw something in Jesus. In the person of Jesus, not in Jesus the God, but in Jesus the of Nazareth, Jesus the carpenter, Jesus that needed to go behind the bush once in a while, Jesus who was tired and who was hungry, hungry, did you hear that? A little bit angry and hungry, hungry. And yet they saw something different in him. And they say, Master, teach us how to pray. Teach us like John the Baptist is teaching 
his disciples to pray. And Jesus says, hmm, that's perhaps the first good question you ask in those three years I'm with you, or two and a half years. Now he didn't say that, but I, I, I suggest, almost think, I almost can hear what Jesus was thinking there. And so he said, pray like this. Our. Can we stop there for a second? Our. You have the same father than I do. You have the same father than I do. Our father. I love songs, and we had one when we sang Our God. Did you hear the word me, my, I? No. We recognize really for who God is, our. But then we also song, uh, sing a second song, 10,000 Reasons, the, the song that you will hear at my funeral. There's a lot of me in there. Just change the word next time and you sing the song again to us. So to remind us that we are family because it is by our love to one another that the world will know that we are members of the church of God. I, I think that's what the Bible says. Am I right? No. We are hopefully known by the love we have for one another by this exhaling that the world will know that we are followers of Christ. Our differences are of no consequences. I'm born in Germany and one of the church members I was pastor to, she was born in Holland in the 30s. And it was really strange. We talked about this, that we used to be enemies. And now we are in the same building, having the same father, not the same past, but what? The same present and the same future. And now I go totally off script here. My wife is already, oh, what is Manfred we're doing? Let's go back. The Lord's Prayer, Tertullian, one of the big cheese dudes in the history of the church, called it the summary of the gospel, and I think he's totally right. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie im Himmel, so auch auf Erden. Und vergib uns unsere Schuld, wie auch wir vergeben unseren Schuldigen. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöse uns von dem Bösen. The Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer. It is also an acknowledgement of the injustice, the hunger, and the evil in this broken world. And we acknowledge in this prayer that we are inhalers. And sometimes we forget to exhale. It is a statement of faith, but it is also a statement of forgiveness. A call to worship and a cry for help. It is a bold pleading for divine glory, renewal, it is not just a prayer. It is a vision that Christ has for us. Our Father. That includes Jesus. Who? Oh, Jesus is suddenly what? Not just my Lord and Master and Savior. Somewhere back in history, 2,000 years ago, roughly, a man of history? No, he is part of the family I actually belong to.
It is an overlooked and beautiful dimension of the Lord's Prayer. That it is not a singular prayer. You will not hear the word I or me, neither in English nor in German nor in Takali nor in Greek. It's our, it's us, it's we. Jesus reorients us from our individualistic, I am blessed, I am happy, I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am whatever, to for the reason of being a blessing. It helps us to see our interconnection. We are family. Even with those across the street, those, those Catholics, or those Uniteds, or do we have Mennonites here? Those, those two. Mennonite brethren too. That's where Shannon comes from. We are family. Among the many empty words the disciples had heard all their lives, the empty and broken promises that littered their lives, the religious promises, the religious ideals, suddenly they heard words of life. In this prayer, Jesus shared with them a, a truth we all need to hear. God is first and foremost Father. He didn't stop just being a creator. If he would be just the creator and the sustainer, which he is, don't get me wrong, and the provider, Jesus would have said this. Let's pray it. Our creator, who are in heaven. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus wants us to see the focus of relationship. Of the unbending relationship. Unending relationship. Unbending, maybe that works too. Unending relationship we have. And how do we know that? Because I love the book of Genesis. I think everything goes back to this book, particular chapter 3. Anybody knows what happened in chapter 3? Hmm? Now, quick summary. There's a little snake, pretty smart. She goes to, or it goes to Eve and said, hey, looks good, doesn't it? And Eve said, well, I'm not supposed to eat it or touch it, but it looks good. So she took it, whatever it was, and had a good chew on it and said, hmm, Adam, I think you should take it too. And Adam took it. Sin has entered the world. Later this evening, what do we hear? God walking in the garden. Strolling, enjoying creation. That's what he had made. And then he said, hmm, Adam, where are you? Do you hear that? You come home, just think with me for a while, and you, anybody has an animal, a dog? Think the relationship for a second. You know, creator, creature. You come home and your dog ate your sofa. You see it right away. God knew that something happened terrible. 
and he's still walking and he's still calling out. What are you going to do with your dog? You are buying a new sofa. A stronger one. And you don't leave the dog home alone for too long. Something similar. God the Creator said, Huh, I have to make some changes here. But he didn't give up on the relationship. He was still father. Now with some changes in the relationship. He was still seeking out the sinner. He was more interested in the relationship that only he can restore. Like the dog can't fix the sofa. The dog can't buy a new one either. Can't clean up because he has no thumb. This is basically the relationship. We are the creatures. And God is the creator. And he said, Adam, where are you? Sinners heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden. In the cool of the day, and they hid. When our little hooch messes up, he hides. And he's waiting for my call. And I say sternly, Hachi, what did you do wrong? And he knows it. Adam knew it. And he wanted just to inhale. The woman you gave me, you are at fault, God. And if you don't accept this, God, the woman made me. We don't want forgiveness. We want justification. I'm justified because you, her, and the woman, this beast. And God says, huh. How do I keep a relationship with people who want justification without exhaling, without being a blessing to one another? And for that reason, we turn still inside. He wants to, us to turn inside out, to restore his creation into the relationship God the Father intended us to have to be family. Yes, at times, Shannon, like it or not, irritates me. Some of her behavior is disturbing to me. 25 minutes Sunday morning in the bathroom to take a shower and getting dressed? What in heck? I need the bathroom. What happened to the towel? Why is this on the floor? Oh, it's not your son. Oh, it's mine. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son. In other words, for the father sent his son. Huh, my brother. My oldest brother, the one I'm supposed to love. And he sends my oldest brother to the cross. Hmm. When the disciples were with Jesus, several times he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? In Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. It's a common question. And so this morning I want you to think about for a second. What do you want Jesus do for you? Is it proper English? Well, you, you get the point. What do you want him to do for you? 
I want this. I want this. I want this. Think about, Father, make me more generous. Help me to love the other person more. Help me to seek forgiveness. Help me to seek to restore the relationship. What do you want, Jesus, to do for you? A new car? A new house? A better wife? A better husband? Better salary? Better house? Bigger house? Nicer dog who doesn't eat the couch? Or sofa, or whatever you call it? Or do you want, Father, help me to enjoy the life you have given and intended for me to the fullest? Bless me so that I can be a blessing. So many of us have questioned doubts, uncertainties, and fears. But in the Lord's prayers, we get the answers. Yes, we have our fears. Yes, we have our doubts. And we can share them with one another. But we have also the answer. We are not alone. We belong to a family. Hmm. Teach us how to pray, Jesus. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your come, kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth. So in other words, among us, we acknowledge in this prayer, it doesn't happen quite. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to pray for it. May your will be done on earth. Now, what's the will of God? Any suggestions? That I constantly inhale? That my fridge is full to the brim? That I have an extra fridge in the garage and a freezer box downstairs? May you will be done. And the will of God the Father said everyone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? <sighs> By exhaling. Ultimately, we cannot pray the Lord's Prayer without stepping into our broken world as Jesus' disciples, as Jesus' brothers and sisters. The prayer, I believe, is, can, allows us to look at us with new eyes. It opens our eyes. It brings us along to participate in Jesus' work and God's world mission. We aren't just praying in, for God's name to be glorified and for his kingdom to come. Only in this church but on earth. So when you go later on to a restaurant, be nice to the waitress or to the waiter. If you go home and you see your neighbor, maybe you can be an exhaler for him. Not just an inhaler. <sighs> Although it's necessary. Without inhaling, there's no exhaling. For love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. One more time. God is love. God gave his son. Love is patient. God is patient and kind. God is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. God does not demand his own way. He is not irritable. He does not keep record of being wronged. He is like the father who runs towards his son who is still stinky, filthy because he just fed pigs. And then he embraces him. 
And do you hear what the son is trying to say? Hey, I'm not worthy. And he said, shut up. Sorry for that. Be quiet. Servants, come. Get him dressed. He wasn't even washed yet. And he get redressed into the status of sun, of air. God is more interested in relationship than he is in rules. And yet, when we break rules, they are still broken. Does it make sense? But he asks us, don't be ashamed. Don't think you are unworthy. For you are my daughter. You are my beloved child. I humiliate myself to the point on the cross that I hang naked on the cross in Jesus Christ. God does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. God never gives up, never loses faith. God is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. This is who God is, and it is the living, it is the life giving love that the Father offers to each one of us as we inhale and exhale. May God bless you so that you can be a blessing. Amen.